Welcome to the CEO Breakfast and Strategy Series co-hosted by the Schneider School of Business and Economics at St. Norbert College. I am Brian Brees, the president of the college, and it's my great uh, privilege to welcome you here on this beautiful spring day. The sun is shining, as it is every day at St. Norbert College. <laughs> this is our 21st year of the CEOs Series, and it provides executives in the area the opportunity to hear from some of our top CEOs, and today will be no different. This resource is brought to you through the generosity of our presenting sponsor, WPS Health Solutions. The title sponsors are Myron Construction, Johnson Bank, Johnson Insurance, and Insight Publication. The sponsor for this session is J.P. Morgan. And you have at your place folders with information with our sponsor, about our sponsors. We invite you to take that with you. Um, and I was really delighted this morning because one of our Norbertine sponsors uh, and founders, uh, Father Peter, was going to do the prayer but he was unable to make it this morning, so you're left with me. <laughs> so I invite us to just take a moment to uh, recognize that we're in the presence of the Lord, and if we could together uh, pray, bless us, O Lord, and these I gifts which are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, bon appetit. I'm so looking forward to this. I mean, what an event. You come in and you're gonna leave healthier than when you came, <laughs> feeling better about yourself. Um, it is my great uh, pleasure to introduce Mike Devereaux. Mike is the president and CEO of Nature's Way. He joined the business in 2001 as a CFO when it was enzymatic therapy. He was promoted to COO in 2006. In 2009, enzymatic therapy was purchased by Nature's Way. Nature's Way was based in Utah and is owned by the Schwab family, a 150-year-old family business focused on plant-based medicine headquartered in Germany. After integrating the two businesses and headquartering the new company right here in Green Bay, Mike assumed his current duties in 2011. This year, Nature's Way will celebrate its 50th birthday and its mission to help people find a better way to achieve healthily. Remains the passion and focus of the over 750 associates in North America, 500 in Green Bay. Remarkable. <laughs> Mike grew up in the western suburbs of Chicago in an Irish Catholic family. Maybe he'll say a little bit about that. He received his undergraduate degree in accounting and CPA from DePaul University and later earned his MBA in international business and finance also from DePaul. Nature's Way is proud of its long heritage as one of the most authentic and trustworthy suppliers of natural solutions for health and is one of the best kept secrets here in Green Bay. Their products can be found all over the marketplace from independent health food stores to the largest retailers such as Walmart, Amazon, Costco, and Walgreens. You're really going to enjoy hearing from Mike Devereaux. Mike. Okay, thank you. Ah, so yes, I uh, went to DePaul. I know it's NCAA tournament time. When I was in uh, college, we were the team to beat in college, and uh, now we're the doormat of the uh, Big East. <laughs> and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Matt, told me that we're actually in the finals of uh, some obscure tournament I never heard of. Uh, <laughs> And so that's how much I've lost touch with my basketball team. But I did pick Auburn to be in my Final Four. So, so far I'm hanging in there with our, uh, with our company pool. I don't think the, the, uh, you know, the Duke Blue Devils was my team to win. So I, uh, I don't think I'm going to win the tournament. But nevertheless, it was a, it's, a, it's a fun time of year for those of us who are college basketball fans. So again, thank you for uh, giving me the chance to talk this morning. If this presentation doesn't go so well, you have Phil Hauk to blame. Phil was, is, uh, runs our tech group and convinced me to do this. So uh, what, you're gonna, <laughs> what you're gonna get this morning is a first time presentation. I haven't really uh, given this before. So we just sort of created a uh, topic and uh, put some slides together and hopefully you'll find it interesting. So I'm gonna do a little bit of talking about our company as well as uh, a topic that I think is pretty important for all of us. So good. So I'm going to kind of cover four main points today. 
Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a new word. We're in a fidgetal world, so I'm still getting my uh, getting used to that word. So it's the coming together of the physical and the digital. So I don't know if you've ever heard the word fidgetal, but that's a, a new word for me, and uh, hopefully it starts to sink in. Um, in that regard, I'm going to talk a lot about understanding your customer and their journey. It's going to be a really important topic for any of us who are running consumer businesses. In that regard, content is king, and really given some, some uh, discussion on how important content is. And then lastly, we're going to talk about just embracing change. There's a lot going on in the marketplace. Those of us that are, are uh, running consumer product businesses, um, you know, the transformation of retail to e-tail is, is quite amazing and how quickly your business models are changing as a result. So if we're not um, strapping on and enjoying that ride, uh, you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to be left behind. So it's really important that we think about that. But before I talk about that, let me give you a little bit about me and my family. So uh, I'm this little guy right up here. Um, grew up in an Irish Catholic family, um, fifth of six kids, um, all of us a year apart in school. So I'm not really sure why mom and dad stopped at six, but you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, when I was in grade school, I was already, you know, four siblings ahead of me. So the nuns knew all about the Devereux family. And if I ever got out of line, uh, mom and dad probably found out before I got home. But I grew up in a little bum bungalow, so you probably recognize these kinds of houses if you're in the, the suburbs of Chicago. They're like literally 10 feet apart, so you can literally almost look out your window and see your neighbor uh, literally 10 feet away from you. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why I shared this picture um, is really about what life was like in the 60s. Um, so you, you know, those of you who, uh, maybe are in my age demographic. Some of you, you know, I notice a lot of people who probably don't know anything about this, but uh, you know, back in those days, uh, you shopped in these catalogs, these Sears catalogs or Montgomery Wards catalogs. And so that, you know, that group of kids, you know, when the catalog showed up, you know, we all got a chance to look at it, you know, pick out the things, you know, our school clothes, our shoes, you know, at Christmas time, our, our Santa Christmas lists. And that was really the way you shopped uh, in the early 60s. Not the only way, but certainly those catalogs were very important. Um, I might argue that uh, Sears was the Amazon before Amazon. Um, and yet we didn't have the sort of computing power back then. So while, you know, here are these catalogs showing up at literally every household around America and you know you're you're clearly your demographics are being uh, found out by what your ordering patterns are what what kinds of things you're buying out of these catalogs and yet we had no uh, computing power back then so all that data was probably not being mined like like it is today and in fact Sears um, you know their their next generation of their business model was to get away from the catalogs and start opening stores and the big department stores and the malls. So, you know, all of that incredible data was probably just sort of left behind for the new generation of, you know, we're gonna get into physical stores and we're gonna start being available to you to shop in our stores. <coughs> so I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but let me talk a little bit about Nature's Way. So we mentioned this is our 50th birthday this year. Um, maybe one of the unkept secrets here in town. Uh, I've been with the company almost 20 years. My colleague Matt, uh, 25 years. So a lot of years we've been in this town. Um, kind of flying a little bit under the radar probably because uh, I know over the years we probably haven't really gotten out and broadcasted too much about what we do, but we've been selling health for a long, long time. Uh, we've got over a thousand products. We're all over the marketplace. Um, we sell to doctors. We sell to specialty retailers. We're in the mass market. Um, some of the products that you see on your table, the, the Sambucus gummies, Trader Joe's just said yes to that this week, last week, uh, Sam's Club. So we really have really built pretty cool business. And uh, 
and you know, my team, the, the organization just falls out of bed every day thinking quality. Um, we really are passionate about what we do. The organization really uh, sweats the details about how to be you know, most effective in terms of what we bring to, uh, to the marketplace. So it's really a cool business to be part of because when you go into the organization, you really see the passion and you really feel the passion of an organization that really cares about what they do. So I'm very proud to be part of this. Um, this is a little bit about our business. So back in 2010, um, the majority of our business was in what we call the specialty channel. So a lot of independent health food stores, Whole Foods would have been like a big customer for us back then. That would have been like the big customer in, in the specialty channel. We had started to touch the, the FDM market. Um, the e-commerce was just starting to happen. Amazon was just starting to sell supplements. So there was a, you know, a, an emerging development. But here we are today, um, over twice the size. So we've grown tremendously over the last eight, nine years and really diversified across all of those. So we're really an omni-channel business today. So across doctor channel, across specialty channel, <coughs> mass market, e-commerce. <coughs> What's here is, um, is a mental model that I'd like you to sort of focus on for me for a minute. It's, it's how we strategize in the business. And so what we do is we talk about our business all the time over three horizons. So the horizon of today, which is how's the business? What is it today? What's it gonna look like over the next 18 months? We then start to get into you know, the next three to four years, so horizon two. And finally, where is it gonna be five plus years from now? And it's really a way that we, we get all the business units to really think about their activities over those three horizons and really force themselves to see where they see the business gonna be, you know, not just today, but over the course of the next five plus years and start to place very specific objectives against each of those horizons. So for example, this would have been a slide that probably was placed somewhere in that 2010 frame when we started talking about omni-channel sales focus. It was through that that you start to develop your competency across you know, the omni-channel. <clears throat> it was also in that time we started to say, you know, we really need to start investing digitally. Um, at the time, back in 2010, when, when it was omni-channel sort of sales focus, that was a time when we're starting to say things like, this brand we have called Alive, which is our multivitamin brand, really belongs in the mass market. It belongs in Walmart. It's a, it's a brand that has tremendous consumer cachet. It's very unique. And our mission as a business to help people get healthy doesn't just apply to people who shop specialty health food stores. It applies to wherever people shop. So really forcing ourselves into thinking differently about how we're going to sell our products. At the time when we were merging uh, with Nature's Way in 2009, 2010, very, very lively debate in the company about going to the mass market. So it was one of those moments where we were really at odds as a management team. You know, the team from Nature's Way was, you know, the mass market is where good brands like ours go to die. And some of us on the enzymatic side were like, this is an incredible brand. We could do a phenomenal thing with this brand in the mass market. So we were really sort of butting heads. <clears throat> Ultimately, we made the decision to go there and it's been nothing short of a spectacular achievement. Digital investment. The guy who was running our marketing organization back then, uh, he used to say things to me like, I'm a traditional marketer. And you know, I, I'm, my background's finance, so I didn't have like a tremendous amount of <laughs> sparring ability with somebody who spent their career in marketing. So I was sort of like, all right, well, I get it, but you know, don't we not see digital being an emerging theme? And while traditional marketing is important to us, what about the digital side of marketing? And uh, ultimately, in about 2014, he and I just agreed to disagree forevermore and we parted ways and uh, we moved into uh, we closed our office in Utah which is where our consumer marketing office was based 
Um, for me, it was one of those moments in my CEO career where I thought, all right, I just closed my most one of my most important functional activities, which is my consumer marketing team. I just said goodbye to that team, closed the office, and we're going to open a new office somewhere at a time when the business is experiencing tremendous growth. Have I just like cut my own throat? Um, as it turns out, a few months after, a lot of people on the management team are saying things to me like, Mike, what took you so long? You know, it was clear to a lot of people in the organization that that digital investment was really, really important for us to put a lot more substance behind. And then ultimately, in the next horizon, we got to be great at this stuff. It's not just a case of getting OK at it. It's a case of getting fantastic at it. So again, this sort of three horizon thinking is a way of helping us sort of hold ourselves accountable, hold ourselves to you know, a vision of the future that, that shows it's an evolution, it's going to change, and really causing ourselves to actually do something about it to sort of create that change. So it's a good, it's a good model for us to run as a business. So again, now I'm going to get into a little bit of our, of our presentation specifics here. But this would be a, uh, a theme or a sentence that we would talk about relative to how we've begun to really transform the business digitally. Align our digital touch points and emotionally connected marketing to a consumer journey aimed at moving consumers from awareness to trial to brand loyalty. So simple words around how do we become much more digitally focused as an organization. So with that, I'm going to now start talking about um, the specifics of, of, our, of our conversation today. So we're in a fidgetal world. So again, that the coming together of the physical space with the digital environment that, uh, that businesses are needing to operate in. And here are a couple great examples. <clears throat> so everybody knows Amazon. Um, you're probably all Prime members. You've probably all got your account. You've figured out uh, what a great deal it is, how convenient it is. Uh, how easy it is to, to shop. Amazon at the same time has sort of figured out that that physical space probably matters more than they maybe thought 10, 15 years ago. So a few years ago they bought Whole Foods. Whole Foods, as you, as you may know, is, a, is primarily groceries. Um, that's an area that we consumers still believe, you know, that physical activity is pretty important. You know, you want to see the produce, you want to see the food that you're going to eat before you, you know, it's, it's a lot more fun to shop groceries face to face than, you know, on a website. And so they're, they're really trying to figure that out. Um, arguably with maybe some challenge, you know, you've probably been reading a little bit about them lowering prices now and, and starting to figure out how hard this is. You know, it's hard to make money in groceries. I was part of Beatrice Foods years ago, and uh, I remember way back then that, you know, the business was billions and billions in, in revenue, but, you know, the bottom line was, you know, pennies on the dollar. So it was, like, really hard to make money at groceries, and, and I think, uh, you know, Amazon has figured out that if they're going to try to encroach that space, they've got a lot of work to do. Same thing with Walmart. So Walmart would have been a disruptor before Amazon, right? So back in the, in the 80s, in the 90s, Walmart would show up in you know, rural areas and all the little independent health food stores would hate them and for very good reason. Um, and Walmart was suddenly the disruptor of the retail space. And here comes Amazon over the last 10, 15 years and they've suddenly got Walmart by the throat and figuring out that, you know, hey, we're losing a ton of our customers to this, like, digital organization called Amazon. So they've started to invest in things like Jet.com and Walmart.com and really have figured out that if they don't really get this thing figured out, they're going to be a dinosaur like, like some other companies have. So it's really become a very interesting battle being waged in the marketplace in front of us, the physical space and the digital space in both cases. Where a digital was strong, they need to get stronger physical, and where physical has been really strong, they need to get stronger digitally. And this is kind of the way we operate as consumers. So, you know, it used to be, you know, we would go to a store, maybe we used our cell phone to, to do a little bit on the internet. Um, 
some social media. A lot of times we did these things sort of independent of each other. Nowadays, everything's so connected and we've gotten so like used to this that it's almost like second nature. You don't probably buy anything anymore without immediately getting on your cell phone and shopping a little bit, getting reviews, figuring out what people are saying. Yeah, you still go to the stores, but everything has gotten so very interconnected. So, it, you know, the note up there says 82% of smartphone users consult their phones to make before purchase before they make a purchase in a store. So you literally do nothing without connecting those two dots, the physical space and the uh, sort of digital social space. Which then brings me to my next uh, sort of sticky point, which is understanding your consumer and their journey. So this would be what we'd call a consumer journey map. So you, you'll recognize this. So it often starts with a trigger. You figured out um, that you got a problem of some sort or you want something. It could be a new outfit for uh, dinner this weekend. It could be a uh, golf club that uh, you, know, you want to purchase, you know, the vitamin that you are interested in picking up. But you've got a trigger. And right after that, you start to really consider and define what that is. What, what is that problem that you're trying to solve? Um, and inevitably, you're going to start evaluating it, uh, looking at options, um, asking people, uh, you know, getting, getting a lot more information. Eventually, you're going to make a decision. I've decided I'm going to buy this club or this bottle of vitamins. Um, now you're going to start validating that decision. Um, Hopefully, it's a great decision. You love it. Um, if you do, you're going to start sharing that experience. You're going to write reviews. You're going to talk about it. Uh, you're clearly going to interact about that. And if it's really something you love, you're going to become very loyal to that brand, most likely. It's going to be your brand now for good. You know, I'm a tailor-made driver person and I buy everything tailor-made or, or I love nature's way vitamin or whatever it is you become very loyal you start to really make that your brand so this is this is sort of a typical consumer journey and as a business we now need to become very effective across that journey and so this would be an example within our within our brand so some of you have these these boxes on your table back in 2014 we sold a probiotic called Fortify. It was primarily um, sold on the basis of how many bugs were in the product. So it sounds a little bit gross maybe, but 30 billion live bugs in a probiotic. And you know, we were in this sort of race for you know, volume of bugs. And so as you know, consumers were telling us more is better. You know, we want more bugs. So you know, 30 billion and now it's up to 50 billion. And now you're going to start doing things specific to gender. You know, I want, you know, probiotic for the 50 plus, you know, age demographic versus women versus men. And as we got deeper and deeper into conversations with people, they started saying, you know, I want more than a probiotic. And by the way, this bug thing, I'm not sure I get it. You know, what I care about is the strain of the probiotic, the strain of the bug. So get me the strains that matter and you know bring a little bit more value beyond the probiotics so now you've got immune you've got digestive you've got energy so you got a number of different sort of you know add-on value adds to it so it's now you've you, you've now gone through the consumer journey you've learned along the way and you've adapted your product to meet you know the consumer where they where they meet and so it's 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 a good example of how that how that works <coughs> Which then brings me to the next point, content. So content is king. Um, you know, again, we've, uh, we've as an organization, you know, we got ourselves onto Amazon. And, you know, when we first got onto Amazon, you know, first of all, people who buy vitamins tend to be, um, they A, have a little bit of money. So this stuff isn't always, you know, inexpensive. So it tends, tends to be a consumer who's, who's got a little bit of money. When they start buying vitamins, they tend to keep buying vitamins. So you don't just take them once and stop. You start to take them like every day. So you're a very loyal 
And as you learn more and more about vitamins, before you know it, you're taking lots of vitamins. So I get up every morning and I have a little Dixie cup that's about half full, you know. At night, I got another one. So you get like crazy about this stuff, right? So, you know, so the Amazon sort of figured that out too. You know, that's the perfect consumer, the person who's got money, the person who buys every month, person who buys across a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> so we were, you know, right out of the gate, pretty good at Amazon. You know, right out of the gate, people were, uh, that model was working. But it, it started to sort of figure, we started to figure out fairly quickly too that, you know, there was a lot more to it than that. So we have these things, they call them A plus pages. So our, our Amazon page back then was, you know, Sambucus, you know, $12 or whatever it was. It, food supplement it was described as. So it had very little like information, but you know, it was a vitamin and sort of people bought it and we thought hey, this is good, but eventually they stopped buying it or they just sort of slowed down the buying pattern. And we learned, hey, you gotta do a lot more than just tell them the obvious. You need to tell your story. You need to talk a little bit about the supply chain. You need to have maybe some video. Um, so the consumer, when they start to interact with your brand, they get a lot more information because if they don't get that information, they're gonna disappear almost as quickly as they showed up. And then you're gonna need to start building that content in many, many, many different ways across the ecosystem. So not just what your website says, but you're gonna start having social media. You need influencers to talk about your product, you know, whether it's the, you know, the crazy Kardashian family or whatever, it's like you're, you're starting to really build um, you know, an ecosystem of content. And you're trying to find that consumer at all different places where they shop. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very interesting process. And building content and engaging people in many, many different ways all across that journey ends up being a critically important aspect of it. So this would be um, the three sources of content. Um, you know, in, in marketing vernacular, they talk about the five P's of marketing. These are the three C's of content. So the first one would be called the created content. And that's always stuff that you, mostly about yourselves that you create. You know, your own, uh, your own story, your, your website, um, you know, the history of the company. Uh, so a lot of the things that you know about yourself and that you want to make sure the marketplace understands. Then as you start to get even more effective at this stuff, you start collaborating. You start looking for, I use the word influencers. In this case, it's our 50th birthday this year. We've got Mandy Moore. So I don't know how many people know Mandy Moore, but uh, this is us. Uh, uh, really cool story about her maturation as a person over the years. She was a sort of a pop star in the Britney Spears era back then but now she's a very accomplished actress, um, very philanthropic. So for us, somebody who very much aligns with our ethics, so it, it feels good for us that Mandy Moore is talking about Nature's Way. So she's collaborating with us. We're, we're using her to really promote our brand. She's got a couple million Instagram followers, so all those people now know. You know, I, my daughters were all texting me, Dad, you got Mandy Moore. You know, I'm like, I didn't even tell them. It was like, they told me, which was kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> you know, and then, uh, then there's curating, and this is sort of that, like, just being part of the community. So an example being, you know, me being here today, maybe this video that we're, uh, it'll show up on YouTube, and maybe, uh, you know, people will say, hey, cool things about Nature's Way, they, they came and talked about their business, they did it in an educational setting, they talked about a topic, so you start to create, you know, content in many, many different ways, and really just get your your business to be admired for all kinds of reasons, be it the, the collaborators you attach to, be it the cool story you have to tell, and be it the, you know, the, the community involvement that you get involved in that really helps bring the brand a lot more energy and a lot more rev relevance. So finally then, my last point is on embracing change. So, you know, this, this slide talks a bit about uh, just how the global economy has sort of looked over the last, call it 100 years. So back in the, the 1900s to let's say the, the you know, 1930 era, you know, 
GDP across the world was very, very low, zero to two percent. I mean, you would literally have generation would, would go through life and almost no real change would take place. You know, that, that was just the way it was. And here we are over the last, you know, 30 to 40, 50 years, where the GDP is growing at sort of two to three to four to five percent annually. So literally the, the, the rate of change is just accelerating as every decade goes by. And, it, and you see it also in the way, you know, the companies that are in the S&P 500. You know, back in the 60s, the, the, the large companies tended to be the same companies for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, nowadays, they're rapid, rapid change in the way, you know, the S&P 500 is, is made up. Um, I mean, we just saw it last week with, with Lyft uh, going public and, you know, the 30 billion market cap for a company that last year did about, I don't know, $2 billion in revenue and lost a billion dollars. So it's like, you know, what, where do these valuations come from and what, what's going on here? But yet a disruptive industry, something that's really going to change the way we think about, you know, transportation and, and all that stuff. So it's, it's a very interesting time for, uh, for change. And, and as I've talked about with this sort of physical digital world, the amount of change that's taken place in our business is pretty dramatic. So then bringing back this, um, this horizon slide, um, again, it, the sort of like uh, headstones that are kind of behind the words here. You see some of these brands, Blockbuster, Kodak, you know, we talked about Sears. These are companies that their business model as we knew them, it basically ceases to exist today. They, they no longer exist as organizations because you know, the rate of change has basically made them dinosaurs and eventually just frankly irrelevant. And, uh, and so for us as an organization to really keep this sort of stimulus in front of us, to always be thinking about our business over multiple horizons, to project where we see it in the future and start to build our capabilities around some of those sort of future states so that when we actually arrive in those horizons. We're ready, we're able, we're already competent there, we're already starting to dictate the way it's gonna be. So again, a great mental model for you to, uh, to sort of reflect on. Okay, so, so again, my, my presentation talked about the last mile. And so our vernacular for the last mile is, um, you know, that last mile before the consumer actually s gets the product in their hand. So, you know, Amazon protects that data like crazy. So as much as we're selling a tremendous amount on Amazon, they give us almost no information about the consumers who are buying our products. So they own all that. So as much as we love our business with Amazon, we get like very, very little data on who actually buys our stuff. And so for us, it's really important that we start to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships so that we start to understand exactly who's buying it. They're starting to have a relationship with us. Um, and, and so it's critically important to our success. But, but relative to this picture, I wanna talk for a moment about the first mile, not the last mile. So I, I obviously don't look like a runner, so I'm probably more like a offensive lineman, but, uh, but I don't know if you know this picture, but this is uh, Roger Bannister. So if I could just spend a few minutes on the first mile. So Roger was somebody who broke, he was the first person who broke the four minute mile. And back in the sort of the 40s and the 50s, that was sort of an achievement that the world just frankly thought was impossible. Uh, the human body could not run that fast to cross a mile in four minutes. You know, the, the scientists said it's impossible. You know, athletes were trying and, and failing. And Inevitably, they said, you know, the only way it's going to ever happen is if um, the weather conditions are absolutely perfect, you know, wind is perfect, the surface that's run on is perfect, um, the stands are filled with screaming fans that create adrenaline that helps this, this runner accelerate on that particular day. So, you know, that was maybe the only way that could be possible. Turns out in the mid-50s and some little track meet in Oxford, England, 
on an overcast day with a 15 mile per hour wind and it was kind of rainy and you know weather conditions were not good. Uh, almost nobody in the stands, so not a whole lot of adrenaline being pumped in from a crowd. And Roger reached the four minute mile. He, he achieved it. Within a month, somebody in Australia also achieved it. Within a year, three people in one race made, made the four minute mile. So here it was for decades, thought to be impossible, and now suddenly it's happening all the time. Since Roger did it, over 1,500 people have now, uh, so practically everybody who's big into running is, is the new standard. So the message being, if you can achieve the impossible, it suddenly breaks free for everybody that, that it's actually possible. So we are, you know, many of us here are runners of businesses. And, and our job is to, you know, sort of think about the future, to sort of set the, the landscape. Um, somebody in our organization is an innovator. You know, maybe it's a new product technology. Maybe it's a process technology. But, you know, we are engaged in innovation and trying to sort of do something that nobody else has done. And when, in fact, we achieve that, in fact, what we also do is we open up the doors for everybody else to say, hey, that is possible. And now we're going to achieve it. And, and for me and for us as a business, we're seeing that happen dramatically in our business. What, uh, what we're starting to accomplish is becoming sort of second nature to us. What we're trying to set out to do is becoming a really inspiring activity. And we're out there trying to uh, you know, build a business that uh, is really, really cool to, to be part of. So again, let me just sort of summarize again. These are the things that I talked about, that sort of blurring of the physical and the digital space. Um, the power shift, it used to be retailers and e-tailers were the power. In fact, it's the consumer who is the power. And really getting to know that consumer very, very well is critically important to our success. Content needs to be abundant, needs to be found in all the places where people arrive and look for content. It needs to be relevant, it needs to be impactful, it needs to help people stay. And then of course, just challenging the status quo. Um, you know, the world is changing rapidly, more rapidly in our generation than any generations prior. And, uh, and I think that's just gonna continue. Uh, I think I read a stat that in the, in the 80s, we were about, four billion on this earth. And most of us were running around, um, frankly, half of us were illiterate. Uh, a lot of people trying to figure stuff out with pencil and paper. Um, I know when I first graduated college, you know, we didn't have Excel spreadsheets back then. I don't mean to date myself that much, but you know, the computers were just starting to arrive. Um, today, we all have smartphones. The technology, the capability of these smartphones is probably better than what existed when we landed a spaceship on the moon. So it's just amazing how much things have, have changed in such a very, very short time. So, you know, the, the key message there is, you know, just be ready for the change, you know, strap yourself in, enjoy the ride. And uh, with that, I'll uh, take questions, I guess. So thank you again for, uh, Okay, question? Yeah, on your, on your horizon slide, the one consistent element that you have in there with leadership development, can you just talk a moment about what you're doing? Because it must, obviously it's important it's in every element of the horizon slide. Yeah, that was a great catch. I didn't, uh, I didn't highlight that one, but it was great that you saw that. Because in fact, it's a little bit what I described earlier about, um, you know, uh, that marketing gentleman who said, I'm a traditional marketer. And yet, if we would have just said, all right, then we're going to live with our leadership and marketing being traditional. Um, we're going to hold back the organization he leads. We're going to hold back ourselves as an organization. So that, it, that being one example, but the, the real message is, you know, leadership happens at all levels in the organization. And, and if you're not embracing that, if you're not 
fostering that. I had a conversation earlier with Scott. I don't remember Scott. We talked a little bit about Motorola. He was uh, 30 years at Motorola, and that was an organization that really did try to create, um, you know, maybe a good, lively debate that emanated from the bottom to the top. So it was sort of like not top-down leadership. It was almost bottom-up leadership in that people were really empowered to talk about the obvious that maybe wasn't being talked about. So really giving an, an organization a license to debate, a license to critique, a license to say, you know, have we thought about this or that? So really trying to create in every horizon um, the sort of leadership that's going to be necessary for us to, you know, sort of not only succeed in that horizon, but to accelerate into the next horizon. But, you know, thank you for noticing that. Mike, I, I hesitate to ask this question because I don't get political, but given the nature of what you guys do, um, and by all means, if you want to defer. You didn't talk about CBD, are you? <laughs> 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 CBD and, and marijuana, what, what is yeah, boy, you know, see, you don't have to be political. Um, yeah, yeah, believe me. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you can take it if you want. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great topic. Um, you know, we were just at our trade show in uh, California, and uh, it's the biggest trade show we have as an industry. Um, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand people there, Matt. Um, but over 200 companies marketing CBD products. And Nature's Way, one of the renowned brands in the industry doesn't yet have something in its um, portfolio um, and for some very good reasons. And it's not that we don't believe that we should at some point in time, but uh, you know, if you've, if you've really read up, up on this, you're seeing a lot of controversy in the marketplace about uh, the science. Um, there's a lot of uh, conversation around do the companies that are marketing this stuff really know what they're putting into this capsule? Uh, do they have it standardized in a way that it's really um, actual what they're doing? Or is it just kind of catching the current fad? The FDA had a bunch of um, warning letters issued in the last couple weeks with companies that are making very egregious claims about what this stuff will do. Um, so, you know, we are absolutely paying close attention to it because uh, it's a hot trend. Um, but we're doing all the things we need to do to make sure if we do get into this space, we're gonna get into it the right way. We're gonna put um, our product in the marketplace well understood, what the science is, the claims that'll be attached to it, will be the claims that are relevant and, uh, and appropriate to attach to it. We'll work closely with the, the uh, FDA on a new dietary ingredient filing. So we're, we're kinda working hard at it, but we're not actively in the marketplace with it because frankly, um, at this point, it's still a lot of controversy about the legality of what of what's out there. So uh, yeah, it's a kind of a quick answer to a very very big topic. So yeah, because because yeah, I mean the some of the products that we sell, turmeric, fish oil, are very much the kinds of products that this CBD will cannibalize. So we have absolutely in the immediate some risk around some momentum we have on our existing product line by not being in the CBD place, but, uh, but if Nature's Way gets there, it'll be there because um, we figured out the right way to do it and, uh, and we've confidently uh, worked with the FDA, et cetera, to, to do it right. So, thank you. Let's give Mike a round of applause. I know there's uh, no doubt more questions, so if you want to stick around a little bit, I'm sure Mike will take questions. Uh, Mike, I'd like to thank you for being here, for uh, inter introducing us to Fidgetal, and what that means uh, for telling your story, uh, what a beautiful story to be told, and your commitment to being in the community. Uh, it's a great story, and we're happy that you're able to tell it here. Thank you for all the work you're doing. And like every smart CEO, I also learned at breakfast this morning that he employs a lot of St. Norbert College graduates, and he has a bunch of St. Norbert College students as interns. So for all those reasons, thank you for today and thank you for your contributions to the community. Let's give Mike another round of applause. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, find Amy Sorensen, who is right here. She'll make a, a copy available to you. Hey, we'd, all, 
just don't want my picture on the internet with all my siblings. I haven't got that cleared with them, but yeah. Yeah. But, but then again, that's all right. You can do that too. Well, how, how much time do you need to get, get to, to get to all five of them? This is going to go viral. You want it on YouTube. It's about to happen. Let, let them know it's going to happen. Please join us for our next CEO breakfast on April 10th. That's next week, April 10th. Boy, that's shocking. Uh, Kurt Kubiak, founder of CEO and Novo Health, will present on could the sharing economy successfully uh, disrupt healthcare? I'd also like to invite you to attend SYNC Luncheon on April 12th. The luncheons feature thought-provoking topics that are timely and relevant to our region's business community. More information on SYNC can be found on the flyer in, in your uh, folders. Uh, I also want to draw your uh, attention to these banners up front, and I'd like to give our sponsors a round of applause for supporting this series. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day.